Hello, welcome to Eric on the Last Taboo. This is your host, Eric Diaz, and today we are joined by my friend, Adam Abramowitz. You got it. I got it. I got yeah. the name right. Got got pronunciation. <laughs> Pronoun- All right. And now, we're Eric on the Last Taboo, typically we've been focusing on mental illness, but now I want to branch out into addiction. And I know addiction is a form of mental illness. But it's it's not the not what we usually discuss with say schizoaffective or bipolar disorder, and now now Adam, um, so, so first off, thank you for coming on the show. Sure. And I was wondering, where are you from originally? Originally, I'm from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Okay. Yeah. And what brought you to Metro Atlanta? Metro Atlanta. I moved here in '96 with my family. My father got a job out here selling packaging. That was very similar to me. Lockheed downsized in California and brought us out to Marietta. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so tell me what ex- what was what what is your when did you what what when did your what what were you addicted to and when did it start? Hmm. I would say. Um, that's a t- that's a good question. I, I'm I I, cl- I I would say I'm a heroin addict, uh, but I'm also an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've also I I would developed the addictive personality and addictive trait uh, when I was in my first year at college. I was uh, I went to college on a football scholarship, and up until that point, I'd smoked occasionally weed and I, I drank on the weekends and stuff. And um, what college did you go to? University of Richmond in Virginia. Oh, okay. And what was your position on the football field? Defensive end. Oh, okay. And what, what role do you think being – it takes a lot of discipline to be in – to play at the college level. And what role does this – the whole, like, obsessive, like, nature, like, always going the extra mile, like, do you think that could – do you think that has anything to do with your addictive personality? Yeah. I mean, in high school, I had a goal. My goal was I want to go to college for free. Like, I want to earn a scholarship. And so, like, my focus in high school was, like, being the best athlete I could and also just, like, I love video games, too. So just ha- enjoying myself while also putting work in for this higher purpose. Okay. And what role did did you start off with, with heroin or was there an injury that led to pain medicine or did you just go straight into the heroin? Well, it's it, it happened like this. I get, I get to college, realize the dream. You know, now I'm going to school for free. I'm a collegiate athlete, but I didn't know what, what was next. I didn't know. So, you know, we were getting drug tested. We weren't allowed to smoke weed anymore. Um, mm-hmm. Barely was it, I mean, the, being on a football team, you're working constantly, physically lifting weights and practicing and going to class and all this stuff. And it was, you know, once I made it there, I was just like, now I'm here. I'm just going to enjoy myself. Mm-hmm. I couldn't smoke weed. Um, and I just uh, started doing things to, I guess, escape. Oh, okay. And when I worked at Kennesaw State, I worked in the food court. And I'd see the athletes there, especially in the summer. I'd see them. They were required to, to swipe in and eat eat a certain amount. Oh yeah. And yeah. Um, how did how did you make how did you make your weight or just keep up your meal regimen? Because you don't see a, I don't see a lot of heroin addicts eating a lot. You know, I I didn't because at that at that point I was on a lot of Adderall. Uh, I, I was taking eighty milligrams of Adderall a day, and so my weight was not being. They had they used to have me go to Breakfast Club at six in the morning. It was mm-hmm. like a little thing they called for guys that were underweight, because I just wasn't eating because I was always on amphetamines, and like that I didn't realize it was an issue at all because they were prescribed to me and they helped me keep my energy and do the class show. Up. I wouldn't say. <laughs> I did the classwork. Show up. I didn't. I didn't really show up for class either. Now that I think about it, <laughs> <laughs> it kept me awake and able to show up for workouts and physical activities. Did the university have any any resources available for athletes st- struggling with addiction? Yeah, that was the thing. When I finally ended up failing a drug test my sophomore year, they had a whole thing set up to to help me. It was an, it was incredible. Uh, did not utilize it. You know, mm-hmm. like I, I, I adhered to what they were saying, but yeah, they had they had protocols in place to help uh, athletes, at least in my case, at my school, student athletes that were struggling. So it's like the classic education metaphor. You can lead the horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Yeah. OK, so the services were available. You just didn't utilize it. Uh, yeah. OK. And then also, how, how long were you able to graduate from from Richmond? No, no. I ended up leaving my junior year. And was that because of other drugs? Yeah, yeah. Well, I ended up losing. Well, I ended up 
being sent home to get sober. By that point, I was taking painkillers every, every regularly, Adderall every day, smoking when I could, cocaine, whatever I could do. I always needed something to, felt like I needed something to be okay. So I, I failed a drug test, and they put all those protocols in place. I went home for a month before I went back to summer school to, to actually show up for those programs. And when I was home for that month, all I did was use OxyContin. And, oh, okay. I, and I, I didn't know I didn't know I was addicted or anything. Like mm-hmm. it, I didn't think I wasn't even on my. What do they say? Like you don't know stuff you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, but, but you the, know what you think you know. So what happened? Might was, not be accurate. Yeah, so I, I get back to school after a month home of doing oxy's every day, mm-hmm. and by the second day, my body was in full withdrawal, and I had a drug test on a Friday. And it was Thursday, and I was sweating. I was in class. I was I was in my dorm room. I hadn't you know just just shaking and and what's happening to me. And I knew I had a drug test on Friday. And if I'd have failed that drug test, I'd have lost my scholarship. My scholarship was a forty eight thousand dollars scholarship. Mm-hmm. And even though I knew that, I left my dorm room and drove to my drug dealer in downtown Richmond to get high. So I you know, that was my first encounter with true powerlessness. Was like I know I can't do this, but I'm doing mm-hmm. it anyway. And I took the pills. I called my dad. He called the team physician. I met with the, my head coach the next day, and he was like, "What do you want to do? Like, you're, you're you've got you know, how can we help? Like, what's going on here?" And uh, he he afforded me the chance to take the year off, go home, and get get myself together. And that's I left school for that year to to go home and get sober. Did you ever come back? I did. I ended up going home. I got on a Suboxone as a as a program program to like help alleviate the cravings for opiates. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just began to spiral downwards. Still, I would save the Suboxones. I would take pills on the week. I'd do whatever I could to stay high. And eventually, I was just depressed in my parents' attic, unable to function. And so they checked me into uh, my first rehab. I went to my first rehab at 21 years old. Um, and then, and that's when I learned about what alcoholism and addiction was and all that stuff. Oh, okay. And Suboxone, what are your views? I know that's a controversial subject in people in recovery. What are your views on Suboxone? My views are about Suboxone is I just, I take the stance that, I mean, anything's better than putting a needle in your arm. Oh, okay. You know, like I just, that's, you, a lot of us are just, fuck, just, can I cuss on here? <laughs> Go ahead. Just, we're just dumb. We're not yeah. very smart. We'll put stuff in there without thinking about it. And I don't know. And my stance, Suboxone, you know, like I, I think at least from my own experience, I have to learn for myself. So I'm not against it, but I'm also not for it. I got you. I yeah. got you. Yeah, because I deal like I never I, I, I'm an alcoholic, not, not never had a problem with opiates, but I could not have stayed sober the first six months. I think it's nitrexone. Naltrexone. Naltrexone. Yeah. I could not have done it. They would have had to keep me locked up without that because my cravings were so bad. Oh, yeah. It's it's so tough. It's like, yeah, it's really it's really hard. Yeah, so ideally you do it you do it without it. But so if you need it, you're, you're going to die if you keep shooting up. So yeah, I, I mean, see where you're coming from If with I that. was a physician. Let's just play <laughs> hypothetically. Hypothetical. Dr. This, Abramitz. Yeah, this, this, uh, I'm an amateur scientist <laughs> over here. So, uh, so like if, if it were me and somebody came into me that was – Detoxing off of heroin and wanted to stop using heroin, a suboxone protocol wouldn't be a bad idea as long it was aligned with mindfulness practices and mm-hmm. also introducing what recovery represents, the, the, philo- the philosophy of it, the principles of it, and the ideology behind it. Now, I was just given suboxone and told, go to meetings, mm-hmm. you know. I'm, I, didn't, I don't know what that means. You know, oh, I, I, didn't, you. I didn't know what a meeting was. You know, I didn't know anything. So... Yeah, if it's if I feel like it can be done in a good way. How well did they prep you for twelve step meetings? Who's they in rehab? Rehab when you were in rehab. When I was in Ridgeview, they talked about the appropriate the appropriate boundaries for your sponsor. They told you he's not your doctor. You, you if you're if you're prescribed psych meds, take your psych meds, and don't let some guy because people overstep bounds at twelve step fellowships all the time. So part of what they did for people that do nothing of alcoholism at Ridgeview. As they talked about, you go to a twelve-step meeting, and they give you medical advice for your psych meds. Because I was always told AA was anti-psychiatry, which it's not. It's not. But I, I just had to. I was predisposed not to like AA. So there's a whole school of psychiatry that's humanistic psychology that that references spiritual things as being the solution mm-hmm. towards a person's self-actualized uh, or mm-hmm. becoming who they're meant to be, kind of a thing. So. 
I, I, get, I get what you're saying, and, and yeah. I, think that's, I think there's two sides to it. I think that on one hand, I don't think anybody is qualified to tell someone what meds they should or shouldn't be on. Mm. It's up to the individual. Yeah. Mm. But I also believe that we can be open-minded. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, you know, I'm, yeah, I don't, is that answer? Yeah, that? I guess the answer is the question. Yeah. But as far as like um, people were just talking about like at Ridgeview, they're talking about what to look for in a sponsor. Like when you get out oh, of right. here. Yeah, just stuff like that. Because you say, you, they said go to meetings. Well, you go to meetings and you don't really know what to expect at the meeting. Sometimes you go to a meeting that's not well run. Yeah. And there's also, there's, there's people that, are, that as human beings, we are imperfect. It's not called yeah. well people anonymous. Well people anonymous. That, that's not, that's not what but AAHA I mean, is. But at the end of the day, if, if you don't want to use a substance and you're willing to like look at yourself and figure out how to solve the issue, mm-hmm. there's no better program in my mind that facilitates that, that, uh, the progressively, mm-hmm. um, I guess, uh, I saved my life. Like you know, AA saved my life, and I'm really grateful for the program, and I'm really grateful because that was my big excuse for not going to AA. Oh, was the was that the idea that was that they were was that, would, they were, was, that was the view that they were anti psychiatry, and without my medication, I I don't really function well. So yeah, you yeah you should yeah. You, so so that was what that was what predisposed me to just have this extremely negative view of AA, and when I was there, they were like, no 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 no. If you go to a, basically if you go to a they, basically what they said is if you go to a bar and you don't like the bar, you didn't stop drinking. So if you go to a meeting and they're giving medical advice, it's a bullshit meeting. Find another meeting. They'll just throw the whole AA under the bus. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I just think we get what we what we put into whatever it is we're, mm-hmm. we're looking for. So the idea that a that a, a program or, or an ideology could be harmful before you even understand what it is yeah. is a detriment. Like, it's not good. I completely agree. Also, I think with me, as someone who didn't want to address it, my drinking problem, I think that was a nice crutch. Oh, they'll... <laughs> they're, yeah. They're bad. I mean, we will literally tell ourselves anything to rationalize what we actually want to do. And it's scary to try different things. It's scary to try new things. It's, it's scary to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation where you don't know anybody. And you've, you're trying to make sense of this thing you can't seem to squash on your own. And you see all these people who are, you know, it seems like they've got something. It's it's cult, you know, it feels culty and weird. Yeah. But it's just like any synagogue, religion, or mosque you'll ever go to. There's like... Any any time we get together as a group and we're all about something, to me at least, I'm always like, this is a little weird. This is a little mm. fishy. I don't understand yeah. this. Yes. So when you left um, when you left Richmond University and you decided to come come home to Georgia, what did you do? What did you do when you left left college? Well, the, now we can. St- this is where we can talk a little bit about you know. Uh, you mentioned schizophrenia. Yeah, I left college my junior year because uh, I I was uh, I fell into a state of psychosis, mm-hmm. and um, the doctors had described it as amphetamine psychosis. I still I'm not completely sure what actually happened to me, mm-hmm. but you know I, I believed I was being guided by God. As mm-hmm. you know, I was being CD players and radios and televisions were being performed specifically for me. Mm-hmm. The girl I was dating, I thought she was stalking me. I thought she was sending friends out my dorm room. I'd run <laughs> out there to check and they'd be gone. I'd be like, oh, they fucking got away, you know, and I'd <laughs> go back in my dorm. So like I left, I remember I met with my head, my head coach and he was like, do you want to play football anymore? And I, I like, I looked at him. I was like, I mean, I could, but I feel like I'm, I'm supposed to do something greater. And I think I need to go make music and, and be a rapper. Oh, okay. That's what I thought. And, uh, and so I left and I did that and, uh, m- my parents will tell you better than I can because it's so hazy because I was being guided by numerology. I was being guided by these voices on the, on the, on the radio and stuff. I thought truckers were communicating where I was going. The full gamut of psychosis I experienced oh, okay. and it lasted four months. How much of this was because amphetamines and just, just not sleeping properly going on very little sleep? That's the thing that's like, there's no way to really tell. Oh, okay. There really isn't. Like, I, I know I personally experienced it. I know I became obsessed with trying to understand it. I ended up working at Ridgeview. One of the main reasons I went to work there after I got sober was because I needed to I needed to find out, like, what happened to me. So I needed to see other people that uh, were going through yes. it. I really enjoyed taking abnormal psychology. 
Yeah. That was one of my favorite classes in college. Yeah, it's uh, fascinating. Okay. And what? so you, you mentioned music being a rapper. I, what I loved about alcohol is it made me not feel like myself. Uh-huh. And that's what I love about art, writing, doing voiceovers, trying to get on theater, is it helps me. It's, an ex, it's a drug-free escape. And do you feel that way about your music? Yeah, and it's 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 interesting. All artistry in, in itself. It started with me with you know music, then writing, then podcasting, filmmaking, and now rapping. It's I the thing I'm, I work through today is is like I obsess over creative things mm-hmm. because it is a form of escape. Do you ever obsess about creative things, but then not do anything? Because I obsess about all this creative stuff, but I always I, I have a hard time getting started. Do you ever have that? I have a hard time getting started. Like on a project. Not anymore. Right. I did it first. So you you over you overcame that. Yeah, I did it first. How, how did you overcome that? I overcame it by telling myself when I had an idea, I need to write it down. Oh. Okay. No matter what it is. Mm-hmm. Even if I don't feel like it, I need to write it down. All right. All right. That was just the very beginning. That's good advice. Also, let's back up a little bit. When did you for when did you get sober? I got sober May 5th, 2013. That's awesome. And what exactly was it that about that hit bottom, that hit bottom and decided to get sober? It's another one of those things where it's like a lot of things, I think, the inflection points in my life, like I can't really understand them, you know? Mm-hmm. The psychosis hit. I never thought I'd be actually rapping. Like mm-hmm. I was so ashamed and embarrassed about everything that happened. Like yes. the fear of, of trying again was – took me seven years to have the courage to yes. try to rap again. It, it's hard to get your confidence back, yeah. and it's hard to be able to feel like you can defend yourself and be like, I'm a good person now. And, and I, 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 Go ahead. Yeah, and also, what does it mean? Like, what does that mean to, for me? It's like I, I, I embarrassed the hell out of myself. I scared people yes. when I was doing it last time. What are people going to think? What do I think? Am I still crazy? I might. Maybe the psychosis never left. All those questions, you know, it's, it, was, mm. it was I had to work through it. So I, you're, you're on stage rapping, and tell me a little bit about that. It's it feel it's just it feels unbelievable. It just feels like a dream. I I it's it's a trip. If people wanted to look up and, and see your stuff, where would they find it? Um, selfwillrun.com. Selfwillrun.com. Yeah. All right. And when it comes to getting um, getting sober, you, you go to do you go to AA and HA, or do you have what what twelve step fellowships do you? I actually that, that, forget that. I don't want to. Violate no, church. I no, I don't discriminate. So, like, I go to Eating Disorder Anonymous on Friday nights. Mm-hmm. I go to oh, we're still going. I go to Tuesday nights. I go to like a meditation group thing. All right. Monday, um, and then throughout the week, I'll go to AA, HA, CA. Mm-hmm. I don't discriminate at all. It's like I'm, Fight Club to me. Mm-hmm. It's like let's learn and <laughs> be human. I am the exact same way, and I try to obey traditions, but I always slip up and blabber that I'm an AA. So. See that's see this I I had to work this one out when I started my podcast. It's like there's a difference between saying you have gone to meetings and then then saying I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, so that there's there's, there's a there's a loophole to say I have gone to meetings, but yeah. I'm not, okay. That, that there was a two year period in my sobriety mm-hmm. where I was going to meetings constantly, but was not working a program. Okay. You know, I was just, I was like, I was trying to make sense if I was an alcoholic anymore. I, I didn't know. Y- yes. So, uh, that's something that, that's something I flirt with the, the thing there. I was like, you know, am I really, am I real? I used to think that if I just raised myself, my self-confidence or had my medication adjusted a little, I could drink like a gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. yes, there's got to be, it can't just be that. I, but yeah, now I real, I don't think my liver will, will ever process alcohol properly. So if I have one, I'm closing the bar down. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and accepting that was painful, but I really don't miss it. Yeah, me either at all. To me, it would, uh, yeah. I, I was just, the obsession and the craving had been gone for so long. Like mm-hmm. the idea of actually, I was like, it wasn't about me wanting to drink or not. I was just like, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I am like uh, exuding these traits of what an alcoholic is. I don't, I don't know. Or a recovered out. It was uh, really confusing. But to answer your question before, the, the why I got sober May fifth two thousand thirteen, I'd been I shot up outside of a Papa John's and I was bringing the pizza to my parents' house to watch Survivor mm-hmm. on Wednesday night, 
And I'm sitting there in the family room, and my niece is there, and she's six months old, and I never held her. And my mom's showing me this engagement ring, talking about how she wants to break it up and give a part to me to give to my future wife. And I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I like, I viewed myself from the outside looking in and was deeply ashamed of this, of this guy who was sitting here with mm-hmm. all these people that loved him and cared about him. And he didn't – all I was thinking about was being stoned and getting high. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I – I looked at my niece and I was like, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not going to be an uncle. I won't be able to be an uncle for her. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed of myself. And yeah. that night I went home and I called a friend of mine and I told her, I was like, I'm going to detox myself. And I went a week in my room and I, I sweated out and it was like, it was fucking, it was painful. It was difficult. By the third day, I, you know, I was lucky in the sense that I had no money and my, there was no gas in my tank at all so when i would call my dope dealer it was like so sad i would just be i remember calling him and just being like i don't know uh, shit and then hanging up it's like Mm -hmm. you know it's i wanted to but luckily i got through it and that was that's what once i got through it and i met my dad for for lunch on the sixth day and i my body had stopped hurting but i was you know i went to meet him and i went to to meet him with the intent of uh, trying to get some money from him honestly mm-hmm. and so i'm sitting across the the table from him and i hadn't broached the subject of needing to borrow cash and i looked him in the eyes and i realized i couldn't lie to him anymore and i couldn't lie to myself mm-hmm. and i was just like listen dad i've been i've been de- i've been relapsing uh, and i just got done detoxing and he was like he looked at me he was like well well what are you going to do <laughs> Because they'd already sent me to two treatment centers. You know, this was, had been an issue for a long time. And mm-hmm. he was like, what are you going to do? Because, I mean, they tried everything. And I was like, I guess I'm going to go to a meeting. And uh, I went to a meeting that day. I, I shared in the meeting. Somebody came up to me afterwards, was like, uh, I'm going to sponsor you. And that began my, my recovery. Like, it was somebody in that meeting, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, the gift of desperation is something that I, I consider – I, I thought I was a low bottom drunk when I was in Ridgeview. But after spending two years and um, going to meetings, I now realized I could have gone down a lot further. And I'm just grateful I well, got. You always can. You always can. So it's always good to get the hit bottom before you're, I guess, dead. So <laughs> there's <laughs> yeah. no, but there's no way to sugarcoat it. Yeah. Well, you know, Adam. Well, you know, Adam. Thanks for coming on the show and sharing sure. your story and. Good luck for you and your artistic pursuits. And sure. thanks for coming on. Happy to be here. And thank you for listening. This is Eric on The Last Taboo. And enjoy the rest of your day.